afternoon and welcome to LVS Perspectives number 15, Mental Health, a focus on our younger children. And today we welcome Dr. Uh, Kim Freeman. So as usual, what I'll do is shortly is I'll pass you over to Dr. Kim, who's going to present to us for about 20, 25 minutes. And then if you want any questions, if you want to bring them through on the, the live chat, then please do and we can answer questions afterwards. Following the presentation, we'll have a general school update as well and you can ask me any question that you have or any query about what's going on in school at the moment. So Dr. Kim has worked in the NHS since 2005 and is a lecturer at University of Southampton and also a cl clinical advisor, supervisor at the University of Reading. She's already done some training with our infant and junior school staff and um, we're really grateful that you're here today, Kim, to talk to us about mental health in our younger pupils. So, over to you. Thank you. So, it's really nice to be invited and um, I'm a keen advocate for people to um, yeah, learn about mental health and how to help young people particularly. So, um, so I'll start my presentation and hopefully um, it says I've been disabled from screen sharing by my host. So is somebody going to help me with that, do you think? Yeah. Yeah. We're I'm on our way. way. Okay, perfect. So, so let me um, start the slideshow. Okay. Okay, so um, it's just... When I was thinking about how am I going to, what am I going to share in 20 minutes to, that might be helpful, I thought that perhaps actually um, introducing you to a model of um, emotion regulation systems within um, all of us might be quite helpful. So, um, and thinking about why we need to talk about mental health in children um, is really because three quarters of um, uh, difficulties, lifetime mental health problems start with um, in mid teens and three quarters by the mid twenties. So that we, we know that children who have um, adults that have mental health problem typically have presented with mental health problems from a young age. And what we also know is that if we can um, intervene early, then we, they have a much better outcome long-term. So the proportion of children experiencing mental health um, disorders has increased over the last three years. So these were the um, statistics from the NHS in uh, July 2020. And it used to be one in nine children um, had a mental health problem. And that number has increased to one in six. Talking to teachers and looking at the number of referrals coming into CAMS and the number of children that teachers have in a classroom that might even be as big as one in four. So the problems are definitely out there in young people. So what can we do to help them really? Schools are on the front line when it comes to supporting children and young people's mental health and staff working in schools are ideally placed to recognise and respond to that. Um, any early signs. And I think what's what, where teachers have a great um, position is that they typically have, you know, classes of maybe 15 or 18 children. And so they have a, a very good norm, if you like, amongst children. And then they can spot those children that perhaps are having more problems, which sometimes when we're raising our own children, it, it's we're not really sure, you know, it, is it a mental health problem or is, is it just the way that they do things or they've always been a bit of a worrier? But I think when they're in that school environment, the teachers are really helpful at helping us to see that um, actually there could be a problem. So uh, the teachers, like um, Christine said, has, have done this teaching in the hope that that will support them and um, guide them in you know, bringing that to, to your attention and also helping where they can in terms of mental health, because I think there are lots of things school can do. And, and it's great that school, um, that LVS are really keen to start that. So when we think about um, how to make sense of the human mind, I thought um, introducing you to the compassion focused therapy model, which I use a lot with children. So I, you know, I, I probably do about um, 15 to 18 hours a week of therapy where I'm sitting in rooms with young people and um, I often use this model for them to help them make sense of what's going on for them 
and they get it. So I think it's a it's a model that that makes sense to all of us. What I would say is when we're talking about mental health, um, it can raise all kinds of issues as we're listening. And I'm, you know, I regularly um, meet with people that that tell me that you know the conversation brought up all kinds of issues for them. So just to say that if that does happen for you today, it's entirely normal and that um, it's really good to be accessing what, what support you need if you need to. So, um, so we know that uh, this model was um, developed by Paul Gilbert, who is um, a very, brilliant clinical psychologist who's got the most wonderful sense of humor if you ever go to any of his teachings he's um, extremely um, eloquent as well when he talks about compassion focused therapy so he's, he's definitely worth listening to so we know that the brain has developed um, over thousands and thousands of years and we find ourselves here with a brain that functions as it does emotions that function as they do and um, none of this is of our choosing so we weren't we didn't choose the families we're born to we didn't choose the type of parents we had we didn't choose the culture the ethnicity the religion all of those things that we're born to, born into and um, develop who we are as human beings um, were not of our choosing so we have to figure it out so what goes on in our mind is not of our design and therefore it cannot be our fault. So I think that is a really nice message. And um, I think children are really keen to hear that message when I talk to them about this, you know, this isn't your fault. And, and it doesn't mean that you're um, anyone with a mental health problem. It doesn't mean that they're in some way defective. They, they are just trying to figure it out and doing the best they can. So. Um, we know that if this system, can you see my cursor if I move around it? Yeah. Um, so we know that um, if this system is not well aligned, so if the threat system, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about in a moment, is um, is too is is firing off all the time, or our drive system is bigger than our soothing system, that is when um, we end up with mental health problems. So these three systems have to be very well aligned and in proportion with one another. Okay, so I'll just talk to you a little bit about the different systems. So the threat system is that um, fight or flight system, it's run by adrenaline and cortisol and when we perceive a threat or there is a real threat to us, we um, have a system in our body that kicks in the adrenaline, which means that we can, the body mobilizes for action and it um, shuts down the digestive system and the blood rushes out to those big um, muscles in our body, such as our arm and legs, ready to fight or flight. So through evolution, that has been a very, very protective system and super helpful for us. Today, it's triggered by lots of things. It's, and it's certainly, certainly the children that I work with, a lot of um, triggers come from um, difficulties and making comparisons with others and not feeling good enough. So that, that threat system can be an internal or an external threat that trigger that goes off. Then you've got your kind of incentive and resource seeking system. So that motivates us to, to, to get up and to be get the resources we need to survive. It's run by dopamine, that system. It's about achievement, attainment, um, uh, making sure we're working towards the goal that make us feel good. So that um, system is often uh, very well equipped in successful people and, um, and works very well. The danger is you can be in this threat system and, and moving to the drive system backwards and forwards in this way and ignoring the soothing system. So we can get into doing mode, which is this one, and not in being mode, which is much more this one. So um, in this 
green system. This is our soothing caring system. And that is um, very much um, about that feeling of safeness and contentment. It's often referred to as the uh, rest and digest system. And when we're in this system, we feel very con content and safe. We feel cared for by others and um, connected to the people that are important to us in our lives. Um, it's very, very um, uh, connected to the uh, attachment. So those children um, who have an attuned caregiver, who support the, their child, help regulate their emotions um, so that those children go on to have patterns and memories of safety, they are... So if you have a, a good attachment system, you are much more likely to have a good soothing, caring, contentment system, which allows you to give kindness to others, give kindness to yourself as well. Um, in order for that system to be well regulated, it's really important that children have interactions with caregivers that allow them um, to express their emotions and that the, those, that expression of those emotions can be tolerated. And sometimes when we're parents, that we can find our children's emotions um, place us back in this threat system, uh, which can be very uncomfortable. So we'll talk about that a bit, a bit more. So talked about this one. So thinking about the triggers um, for these different systems in childhood, what is it that, um, what, what are the external triggers? Um, so family conflict is a big one. We know much, much more now about the impact on um, conflict within the family, domestic abuse. Um, we're very aware that families where there's a lot of um, shouting and distress and emotions that are um, expressed in a very volatile way um, often present in, in mental health services. Obviously, the friendships issues. So if you want to be part of a community, say a school or a friendship group, then and, and for any reason you feel outside of that group, and that happens often with youngsters, then that threat system can go off. Um, lack of confidence as a scholar as well. So lots of young people that I work with have difficulties with learning. They might have learning difficulties like dyslexia or um, other difficulties, and that can create uh, problems for children um, and set off this threat system. And then, of course, bullying. And more recently, the COVID-19 pandemic has been has completely transformed children's lives. And there's this constant threat that we all feel at the moment of this um, illness. So I think that is being really difficult for children as they've um, been through this year. Kind of internal triggers are that idea of not feeling good enough and um, shame and embarrassment. And sometimes that's about mental health problems. And sometimes it's about other things that have happened in their lives. Um, and sometimes children have been, you know, made to feel ashamed of their behavior. And that experience of shame and um, is ex extremely difficult to shift so it takes a lot of work doing that work you know trying to overcome problems of shame with children so it's really important to think about um, how we express our unhappiness with kids so that they don't feel ashamed um, to say the threat system overrides all other systems, all positive emotions, the drive system, and it needs to have been because we've needed to um, survive and we've done very well over evolution. So um, that's why that system is the main driver in, in our bodies when, when, um, when it needs to be. So um, in terms of what triggers this system, uh, for children. So achieving their goals, kind of acknowledgement of their educational attainment will send that off. Gaming, the people that write games know about this system really, really well. So they know that if they keep telling them they're up at the next level, that they've achieved their, you know, 
whatever it is. I I play solitaire sometimes, and I'm always amazed at how many you know fireworks I get when I when I pass a deck and I've gone up another system, and I know that that is playing into this um, uh, drive system. They're very aware of it, uh, and the dopamine driving system is um, well ignited by game gamers. Then there's this kind of internal triggers. So setting and attaining your own goals. So I work with a little lad who um, he's a skateboard fan and he likes to build himself all these different ramps and do all these different tricks. And he talks to me in great detail about um, how he set himself a goal to do those things. And when he achieves it, he's absolutely delighted with himself. So it's not always about academic things. It might be about other other ways of we set ourselves goals I mean it could be as simple as wanting to get all the washing done that morning and and you do it and you feel quite pleased with yourself it can be like that so positive self-talk is a way that um that we can incentivize ourselves and remember what are what the consequences are of working hard that can that can set it off and kind of an internal um sort of dedication to, to, to carry things out and to see things through to the end and um, to overcome um, problems or barriers to achieving their goals, that can be really, really helpful. Um, this system is crucial to kind of su survival and it's responsible for all our kind of pleasure, um, activation, pleasure, those type of feelings, excitement, satisfaction. This is where we where we get these feelings and they guide and motivate us to seek out resources. So it's a really helpful system. So the soothing caring system. Um, this develops, allows children to have um, soothing feelings, feelings of warmth, well-being. It's there's good endorphins like oxytocin, oxytocin. It allows us um, to feel happy and content and we're non-seeking. When we're in this system, we're very non-seeking. Activating this system for children has a profound effect on their organization of their brain. So we know that it is absolutely fundamental to well-being. And if you look at... Um, brain scans of children uh, that were brought up in, say, Romania, when the idea was that you put children in cots and you just fed them, but you didn't develop an attachment with them because it went, when they got adopted later on, they could develop that attachment then. But actually, if you look at brain scans of those children compared to children that have had um, strong attachment bonds, then you can see actually the brain doesn't develop. It physically doesn't develop in the same way. So this system is absolutely key. Um, so the way that you can trigger this system is kind of through family relationships, close friendships, family harmony gives children a really good feeling. So they, they need to feel cared for, understood. They need to experience kindness and encouragement. And this system puts the brakes on that threat system quite quickly. So we used to think the threat system just wore itself out, which is a sympathetic nervous system. But this is the parasympathetic nervous system, which helps by, um, by tuning, turning off that, um, that fight and flight response. Kind of internal triggers is this um, ability to self-soothe. So through the experience of being attended to and cared for and shown love and affection and be um, appreciated for who you are, children develop a kind of an internal working model of that. And it's often referred to in the literature as an internal mother, but it actually it could be, it's an internal carer. And that's the ability to self-soothe and to know things are gonna be okay. So um, Gilbert suggests that um, compassion, if we bring compassion to ourselves and others, we can relieve the distress that we see in ourselves and others. And um, through these interpersonal relationships, we can have this flow of compassion where we feel compassion for others and, um, and others are open to receive that compassion, compassion from us. 
and that we can also be compassionate to ourselves. So there's this idea of a, of a flow of compassion. So often when you think about compassion or you talk to compassion, talk about compassion with people, they often think it's kind of a bit soft and woolly and is it just about being kind? But actually, um, uh, Gilbert has a really, I, I took this out of one of his books because I think it's really important that it's, that we appreciate that it's not actually fluffy and soft at all. It's, it's about facing really powerful feelings and um, the kind of thoughts that come along with those and the strong emotions that we get about that and kind of moving towards it for ourselves and for others. So instead of trying to not, you know, to not see the suffering or to not be with that suffering, it's about being with it and tolerating it and thinking about how we, we can help. So rather than a, than a fluffy, easy or soft thing, actually, it, it takes a lot of strength um, to do that. So um, self-compassion is a bit that we need first. If we can't be compassionate to ourselves, we're going to really struggle to do that for other people. So it starts with a premise that um, your experiences are a part of normal being a human being and being aware of your thoughts and feelings might be painful but it's important to take a balanced approach to them and not be absorbed by them so I'll talk a little bit later about the problems of becoming absorbed by emotions and acting in that in that uh, you know when you're overcome with um, fear or you're overcome with sadness that can really impact on the way that you um, think and feel and act the other thing that's really important is to think about um, taking a non-judgmental understanding towards ourselves and, and, and being kind to ourselves. And I think certainly as parents, we need to recognize that um, we're not gonna get it right every time with our children and that um, you know, there'll be times in our lives where we, did, we weren't patient enough or we feel like we didn't do enough or we didn't hear enough. But that's all part of, yeah, that, that's part of being a human being. And we've got lots of different things going on at different times. Um, so we can reflect and we have the, the ability to reflect and learn, but kind of berating ourselves about that and um, telling ourselves we're not a good enough parent in some way or comparing ourselves to other parents just puts us back in that threat system which is not the best place to parent from. Where we need to parent from is that compassionate system. So giving yourself a hard time or suggesting that you work too hard and you know, you're know you not enough is, is certainly um, a very, I, I work with quite a lot of adults as well. And it's a very frequent message I hear um, people sharing with me is that they don't feel enough. There are a lot of barriers to being compassionate. Um, Certainly, when you're in that self-focused and very competitive um, position, and I think at times we can encourage our children to be here, and that can be um, a real uh, barrier to, to being compassionate to others. And we can get into that ideas about deservedness. Do they deserve it? Or um, um, denying that they've got those problems and therefore we don't need to feel compassionate for them. Other, other things that get in the way is if we just don't like people, it's really quite hard to be compassionate when you're not liking the other person. Um, and also when we find their other people's distress too much and um, then it's quite, we, it's easier to move away from and um, not pay attention to than it is uh, to move towards that suffering and with, with, a, with an idea about helping. So one of the ways I'm sure lots of you um, know about mindfulness. So one of the biggest tools for compassion focused therapy is mindfulness. And um, Buddha has said that there's nothing can harm you as much as um, your thoughts that are unguarded. So what he's talking about is how the unenlightened mind can be really chaotic and um, be taken over by any one of those emotional system. 
Whereas mindfulness allows us to observe that emotional state and observe our thoughts and feelings and what we want to do next. Um, and, and act with intention as opposed to react. So thinking about how we become mindful, and I, I really appreciate that I'm rattling through this, but I, I wanted to share it. And I, I guess it's going to be a germ of an idea rather than something I'm going to teach you today. But we can um, become mindful through various activities. There's lots and lots on um, mindfulness now on the internet that you can find. It requires a lot of practice to cultivate. It's a kind of a way of life rather than something, you know, a strategy or just something you do. And practicing um, with your children allows them to cultivate this ability to kind of see themselves, observe themselves, reflect on themselves, and then think about what they want to do next. So practicing every day allows us um, to develop an ability to apply what we need at the time um, to our distress and discomfort, um, if that's what we need to attend to. So practicing mindfulness with your children is, is an amazing um, thing to do and to encourage. And I've got some ideas about resources that you can use for that. So if we just think very briefly about mindfulness, when we're in our emotional rind, so when we're in that threat stuff, um, we can be in this, this space where, and we just react. So you see a lot of children acting with um, aggression, anger, um, upset, tears, or tears is fine, but it's when you start behaving in ways that, you know, sending texts that we don't mean, or um, I don't, I, I think defriending somebody on Facebook is quite an old fashioned idea now, but those kinds of things where the emotion is taken over and you can't get into this reasonable mind, which is um, where you can be more thoughtful, more reflective, think about the consequences of any action you've got. So when I'm working with young people and adults, I encourage them to notice their emotional mind, notice the thoughts that they're coming in and then engage their rational part of their brain and bring those two things together to think about how they wanna act and behave. So that is called wise mind. When you can bring those two parts together, you're in a wise place. So um, there are six different compassionate um, attributes that you can bring to, um, to develop compassion. And the first one is kind of caring for well-being, so self-care and pro-social behavior, and kind of um, facilitating any distress in others in, in order to kind of um, alleviate distress in others, but also for ourselves to encourage them to flourish and for us to flourish. So sensitivity is about the ability to attend to other people's needs and our own and to be sensitive to suffering and distress. Sympathy is being emotionally connected and moved and engaged by um, and attuned to that distress. And then empathy is the ability to take the perspective of somebody else um, or even take a perspective of a different part of ourselves. So we're, we're many, we, we come in many parts. So you know, I might be sensitive to that angry part of me and try and bring compassion to that angry part of me that wants to behave in different ways. Um, so it's that empathy um, to think about why we feel the way we do and to think about why my critical self might be talking to me in one way when really what I need is my compassionate self. So it's bringing empathy to, to others and ourselves. Being able to tolerate distress allows us to move towards that suffering with a willingness to, to try and help. And um, this non-judgmental stance that we need to, we need to take um, in order to be our best help, we need to absolutely be able to um, support without judging. And it's quite difficult. Um, and it's one of the hardest skills I think here is to, is to be non-judgmental. So it's just an invitation really for you to think about um, 
which of those systems is most easily triggered for you? What are the external internal triggers for you? Do you know what your default position is? How do you elicit the Sue system um, in yourself and in what ways do you take care of yourself? How compassionate are you to yourself if you're compassionate at all? I can't tell you the amount of people that have no idea about this concept at all. So they just don't think about being kind to themselves at all. A lot, a lot of the people that I work with have a very harsh, critical voice. And they think that if they were to give that up, they would somehow be unsuccessful. But usually they come to learn that that actually isn't the case. What helps you bring compassion to your child? Also, you might think about what are the barriers to that compassion that you might show to your child? And then thinking about your child, can you identify which of those systems the children are most triggered in? Um, do you know what their default position is? Do you know how they elicit that Sue system in themselves, if they can at all? And how compassionate are they to themselves? Do you have a little one that you, or, or, you know, an adolescent that you kind of hear giving themselves a hard time um, often? So um, I would ask you to think about that. So I wonder if that might be a good time to end. Christine, how are we doing for time? Does that feel about right? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. Okay. If All you've right. got any questions, if you'd like to feed them through to the chat, and obviously that that was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so much. And a few things just came to mind. I was making some notes throughout because yeah. obviously suddenly things start resonating with yourself, don't they? Of course and, they do. Yeah. And also what you hear about how what other people are going through as well. And um, one of them is the self compassion. Yeah. Thing. And I, I hadn't really realised that as a concept myself until quite a few people had said they were they had been struggling and they had gone to into therapy and they this was this was what the problem was. Yeah. And within a within a very short space of time, things mm. have improved absolutely significantly. Mm -hmm. And it's just that self-awareness, because sometimes we can be compassionate to other people, but yeah. we do beat ourselves up inside. Yeah. Um, so how do you tackle that in people? Like, so, so if we had a self-compassion issue, how do you yeah. tackle that in an adult and how do you tackle it in a child? Okay, so I try and teach them um, how to be compassionate to themselves. So they need first to learn to listen for um, the thoughts and ideas they have about themselves and their self-concept. Um, so I first get them to talk to me about that and how they're thinking. And then we think about how do I, um, so I introduce mindfulness as the first thing, because you have to have that ability to see. So it's almost kind of like taking a helicopter view of yourself. So you're, you're appreciating, I'm thinking in this way, I'm, I'm, I'm reacting in that way, I'm, my perception is this, I'm imagining that. So, you know, you've got to be able to look at that. And, and I'm surprised, I think children can do that from about, the age of maybe nine. I know some children under nine can do that. But so it's an invitation for um, for adults and, and children to do that first. So I try and encourage them to be an observer of themselves first and then to think about what might be helpful in that circumstances rather than a critical voice, which is usually loud and clear in their head all the time. What might a compassionate, kind person say or do and for some children it's very easy because they can draw on someone they know so they might say you know their teacher's very compassionate they've got a friend they've got a nanny their mum their dad and they draw on that experience of what it's like to be spoken to in a kind way in a thoughtful way in a considered way and they start to develop that kind of internal voice for themselves it takes a lot of practice but it's very doable. But I think so. I, I guess it's twofold. It's noticing first the critical bit and noticing first the kind of internal dialogue you have with yourself, kind of thoughts and feelings you have, and then making a commitment to notice that suffering and bring compassion to it to help you think about how what might be helpful right now. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It is so interesting because some of the people that I've spoken to about this, they've they've led 
relatively, there's no such thing as a perfect childhood. No. But they've led a pretty stable life with good emotional stability, good yeah. education, and yet it's still there. So are yeah. there, what other things trigger that? What What's out there that triggers that in someone to make it so, dis it's, it almost disables you? Yeah. I think, I think life today, I think we live between threat and drive. I, that's my thinking, you know. I, I've got more to do. So I go into doing mode. We're forever trying to keep ourselves caught up with what we have to do and what we need to do. So we just go between threat drive, threat drive, threat drive. There's like a really firm pathway through there. And, you know, ideas of around, you know, that teacher's got all of the homework marked and I haven't done it. Or, you know, the, there's all these different um systems in place within the communities that we live in that check that we're doing things right um we, we're, we're constantly being measured aren't we and if 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 there's not in external factors doing that there's kind of internal factors you know she's got more than me her grades are higher than mine um she's fatter than she's thinner than me she's taller than me she's got this more than me i hear that kind of dialogue all of the time and I think compassion really has, has been forgotten, really forgotten. I think we can do that well for others, but I think for ourselves, when you just live in between those two systems, it, unless you're aware of what's going on, you just get stuck on that treadmill. So I think it's all kinds of pressures that we live in. I don't think the world is set up. So, you know, working in the NHS, we, we have... Um, CQC come in and check and this is checked and we get these blooming lists of things saying these this hasn't been done and that needs doing and your referrals are up that much there's constant targets aren't there so off we go into drive again you no know, rushing to try and get everything done I think that is the world that we live in um, thank you and that makes it hard oh, we've got a question here from a parent any suggestions mm. on how we could encourage our children to learn and practice mindfulness that's a good question yeah, um, I think I think doing it together can be really helpful. Um, and I think children will do things if they can see the value in it. And I think I, I think it depends how you introduce mindfulness to children. So there are some children I know, for example, um, certainly I work with, you know, some kids that have got ADHD. And asking them to just lay and be still and do mindfulness would be really difficult. So I get them to do things mindfully. So I get them to, you know, to, to do, I don't know whether they make a cup of tea mindfully. So being mindful is about being in the present moment and being here and now. So I get them to do things that they think um, will keep them in the here and now. Just trying to think things like um, Singing can be really mindful because you've got to remember the words and be very present. Um, you can swim mindfully. There's, you know, getting them in action, doing things in action can be really helpful for those children um, before you get them to do the kind of sitting still and just being with. So mindful, mindfulness in action. And there's some very nice um, resources out there for children that promotes mindfulness. And I often give them when we're, when I'm doing mindfulness with children, and I I do um, often do it in the room with young people. I'll give them kind of a menu of things that we could do together, depending on how they're feeling, and then and then I help them to do that, um, whatever it is. And practicing with them is really helpful. But even with kids with ADHD, they can still do that sitting still stuff once they get used to it. So yeah. So don't think you can't ever teach a child with ADHD mindfulness because actually you can and do it beautifully if you try hard. It is hard and it's practice, isn't it? Yeah, it is about practicing. Yeah. And it's practicing every day. Yeah. I think I don't think we've got any other questions coming through. It was a very comprehensive talk, Dr. Kim. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for being with You're us welcome. today. And okay. um, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. So just to finish up now, just a, a general s school update, a COVID update. So a bulletin went out yesterday uh, to say that we'd had a few positives in school and that we were having to self-isolate the day pupils that were on site. And then those PCR tests that were done externally came through uber quick. 
And so by 9.30 this morning, we're all back in school. So it's great. And thank you. I know it was a bit of a disruption suddenly being able to say that your children at home and then you're back in school as well. So we're just trying to do our best under the, under the government guidelines. But thank you to everyone. And if you have any questions for me coming through about anything we're talking about today, then please just bring them through on the chat. Um, as you know, because we sent a, a message out about the Ofqual consultation, so there's a consultation being driven by Ofqual now, and it's asking parents, staff and pupils their views about how grades should be awarded in the summer, which is brilliant. Um, I've read through the consultation, the proposals are very, very good. It does look like there could be some kind of external assessments that are done nationally to, to bring out sort of parity and fairness across the country um, with, a, with quite a good programme of external moderation, which I think any head teacher and any teacher in this country would be just so relieved to have because last year we were left just to get on with it with little or no guidance, as you know. And as I say, that word algorithm is not in the mix this time. So if you want to have a look, the link has been sent out. So read the consultation and, and please do contribute to it as well because the more feedback that the Ofqual have, the better outcome we'll have for everybody as well. And as soon as we we know what's going on, then in a, maybe in a week or two that we will look at our school exams and assessments and plan for the whole school as well. Because one thing the consultation does say is that they will leave it really up to the last minute, right into the summer term, before any any grades will be submitted by the school. So it looks like we are there's no study leave. 11.13, we are going right up to the wire, right to the end of the term, and there's no reason why we shouldn't all, as a school, be working right to the end of the summer term, but having fun along the way too. So we will, we will revisit how we're going to assess what our internal exams look like how right the way from reception to year 13 in the next couple of weeks. So for now, do not worry about it. Just keep working hard, access your lessons, work hard, and, and just carry on as normal, as far as we can, whatever normal is at the moment. And so what we're going to do today also is send out a communication about co-curricular activities because it looks like, by the way the world's going, that we're in this for the long haul, that we've got to start up co-curricular again. So we're looking at how we can um, give, you, give your children the best co-curricular experience trying to stay away from the screen but obviously that's going to be a little bit tricky for some things so more details about that come out so the things like we'll have young musician of the year great my favorite activity of the year i started that in 2003 i look forward to it every year can't do the principal's dance challenge but there are other things coming on there's house drama there'll be a performing arts competition right the way through the school there's going to be sport going on um, there's going to be so much going on we're working hard to bring that to you and, and so we'll get some details today and we're also looking at how we can enhance our boarding provision as well so what can we do for those boarders that are not with us right now you're still part of our community and what can we do to really enhance your experience We've got to look forward positively. I always say that it's not ideal. None of us wants to be working alone. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll be back together as soon as we can. But meanwhile, we're going to make the most of it. Well-being, our well-being hub is still open and there's still contact. Your tutors are here, your teachers in the classroom are on the end of a, a Zoom call or a phone call or an email. Mrs Cox is here. We're all here to make sure that we're keeping well and safe during COVID as well. And we're also going to be looking at equality and diversity. We're going to look at, at what we currently do. We're going to look at our curriculum. We're going to start off some wonderful activities. And that will lead into a little bit what I'm going to say about WOW in a moment as well. We met with the PTA on Monday night, so thank you PTAs. Um, and we had a, a quick, what can we do? What activities can we do to bring us all together as a community moving forward what can we do can we do bags to school might be a bit tricky at the moment we might have another raffle we are planning the ball okay so we're planning the ball for early autumn so we need to um get brush off our dancing shoes and get ready for that as well so we're looking at all these events that we can look forward to because i'm really conscious not just our existing parents but our new parents haven't had time to meet us all yet and, and we'll soon be coming into a new academic year. So we're looking at ways in which we can, you know, be together as a community and have a bit of fun into the bargain as well. And then WOW also met on Monday night and a plea went out to everybody um, to see if you wanted to um, send an article in for our new for our new booklet that's going to be published. This is the second publication that we've done. The first one was about careers at different points in your life. So when you started to work at 16, 18, 21, when you retired, when you were made redundant, when you were in your third career, seventh career, 
2021 careers by 2020. Nine. And we're looking now at, so, you know, almost the silver linings of COVID. What happened in your industry? What happened to you? How did it kind of turn around and change? And we've got about nine articles at the moment, no more than 500 words. And I, I'll be writing one too about how it's changed working practices, about how we think differently, how has it impacted on you? And, and if, you, if you want to bring in a picture as well, that'd be brilliant. Or you might want to write anonymously as well, which is great. But please, we, we have got a deadline of the 27th of January, but we've got the weekend, we're not going out, we're not going anywhere. So if you feel creative, jot something down, send it to myself or Yamila Yu, who's our chair of the WOW. And, or if you need some help or inspiration, we're here for a chat if you want to have a chat about it. But this is marking in history and it will be read in the future about what happened this year. So please, if you've got a contribution, um, do send it in as well. And we're also planning for Careers Week and it's going to be a very strange kind of way of doing it. We kind of look, when we do Careers Week in June, it will be the end of our project, not the launch. So we're going to be setting up a platform, possibly an extension to our website, where we're going to have and encourage industry talks. We're going to look at universities and UCAS issues. We're going to look at apprenticeships. We're going to look at things like CV building and, and what your management leadership characteristics are. If you're a parent who can contribute to that, whether you want to do a recording, you can come in our studio or you can do it from home. We're going to build this amazing platform that our children and our parents can access. We'll probably even have a little job section as well for opportunities that are out there. And we're going to start working on that almost immediately and um, our wow will be presenting for perspectives on the 12th of February to take this further it's really exciting it's going to be such an amazing project but we need you as our parent body as well with, with your expertise we could really nail this it could be absolutely am amazing and then going on to perspectives we had oh, last week power cut can you ima imagine so all geared up to have Matt Searle from Henley College there was really looking forward to that and then suddenly everything everything went off and I must admit it took me about 30 seconds to actually realize that I couldn't do anything I, my phone was out of charge email was down PC was down perspectives was down so we had to um, ask somebody who was out of the area to contact Matt and anyway no problems power came back on them about half past 12 it's a bit cold but power came back on and uh, we were back to normal and Matt's coming back to join us um, on the 5th of February and we've got a great lineup coming ahead. We're going to have perspectives on resilience. Um, and we're also looking at uh, a new charity called MyOffice.com uh, with Deborah Stretfield, who was the founder of My Big Career, which um, you may be aware of. Um, so we've got some really good stuff coming up. So I'm just going to have a read down some of the questions. So if you have any questions, please bring them in the chat. So here's one. There's an IGCSE ICT exam at the end of the Easter holiday. As boarders, we need to book flights, isolations, so need a bit of a notice if we can. F fantastic. Thank you for raising that. So we are constantly watching the exam boards. At the moment, it says things are going ahead. So I will pick this one up when we come out, um, out of this session so that we can reply to you. And also, if there are any other boarders that this affects as well, because it is all up in the air. Things are changing, as we know but we'll make sure that we have the best provision in place for you and we can really make sure that you can get your flights booked and arrange isolation too. So we were on that one. Thank you for bringing forward. Thank you. Any other questions? It's a very quiet day out there today, guys. Surely you've got some questions for me. No? No other questions? Everyone's going, no, it's very quiet. Okay, well, have a lovely weekend. And I'll see you next week at this time for the next Perspectives. Okay, bye-bye. See you.